I went to the football the other day. For anyone who knows me, you'll know that I don't go to sports very often. So I've got a picture here, oops, to prove that I was there. There was something really special about this football game. See if you can pick it. I was there to see my best friend's daughter play. Daughter, not son. It was another great moment for inclusion in our Australian sporting history. But by the third quarter, we'd forgotten all of that and we were just barracking for Sam to win and their team was leading the entire way. They got through the third quarter and to the end and they lost by a goal. But I left with this great sense of hope for inclusion in sports for everybody in Australia. Now, you might be wondering why a clinical psychologist and autism researcher who's probably more of a ballet fan than a footy fan, is starting a TED Technology talk on the topic of football. Bear with me. What I want to do today is to talk to you about my journey using technology to better understand what autism is. But where I want to get to is an understanding of where the community should be for people with autism. So you might be aware that children with autism have impairments and struggles socially, but also with language and communication. You might not be aware that a majority of children with autism also have problems with movement, problems with throwing a ball, catching a ball, balance. We've been using technology, 3D motion capture analysis, the very same technology that's used to make the Pixar animated movies, to study the way that children walk. So here we have a typically developing child walking. I'll just wait for that to click on. There we go. What you'll notice here is that this typically developing child has a nice smooth and coordinated gait. Next, we have a child who has Asperger's disorder. And what you'll notice here is some very subtle upper body postural abnormalities for this child. It's not quite as smooth as the typically developing child in gait. And to the third one, I think this is the third one. Here we have a child with autism. What we found is that children with autism have a bouncy, irregular gait, a variable gait that might be attributed to a part of the brain called the cerebellum. What we're hoping to do with this technology is to see if we can develop better tools to fit into our toolkit of the way that we diagnose children with autism. More than that, what we want to do is to understand what the motor difficulties are for these children and develop tailored interventions so we can improve outcomes. So technology in the last decade, particularly for children with developmental challenges and neurodevelopmental disorders, has made an enormous contribution. Next I want to introduce you to John. John was the first child to participate in my research and John was amazing with technology. I fondly remember going to John's home in 1997 when I was doing my PhD with a state-of-the-art laptop. It was massive, about five kilos or more, um, and I had a bag of neuroscience experiments on my back. And I walked into his welcoming family home and I started to set the technology up to do this neuroscience experiment that would hopefully tell me um, how John, who had Asperger's disorder, had difficulties and problems in his profile compared to typically developing children. But I was struggling setting up the laptop and the technology. But John, who was just a boy, helped me set the experiment up. John then did the experiment for me. I started to pack up, and I'm sure if I'd asked John, he probably could have analysed the data too, but that was my job, so I was heading back to the lab to do that. But as I was walking out, I noticed this picture. And I asked his mum, who's done this picture? And she said, oh, John's done this picture. And I was in awe at John's amazing artistic ability, just a boy. His attention to detail was flawless. And we see this in children on the spectrum. I spoke to John's parents recently. He's now in his 30s, um, an IT expert and sought after in the industry and happily living with his girlfriend. So I went to John's house to learn about what he couldn't do 
deficits in his neuropsychological profile. But I left with this incredible understanding of what he could do. IT, his artistic ability. Fast forward two decades and recently I was elected to be on an autism peak body and I was absolutely thrilled. I went to the first function, it was a bit of a social function and then the official board function. Um, and I started to feel nervous and had this huge dose of imposter syndrome. Um, imposter syndrome is a common syndrome amongst academics. When we walk into a room of amazing people um, and we feel this sense that perhaps we're an imposter. So I was feeling a little unsettled. But within a couple of minutes, Smiley Brad came up to me and started chatting and I thought, oh great, I found a friend on the board, this is off to a good start and I relaxed. Two minutes later, my imposter syndrome loomed large. Brad, as I found out, was a lawyer and had done amazing human rights campaigns and contributed to the world in extraordinary ways. I wasn't at all intimidated. Soon after, the official board proceedings started and we all went to sit down. Everybody except Brad. It turns out Brad wasn't a member of the board. Brad was an adult with autism who'd come to speak to the board to tell us about his journey with autism and to tell us about what people with autism can do rather than what they can't. I was meant to meet John and Brad on my journey to understanding what autism is and more than that, understanding what we as a community should be for people with autism. But not all stories are like John and Brad's. As a clinical psychologist, I sit with families and I hear their voices and the excruciating stories of exclusion. Exclusion from birthday parties, exclusion from school functions, exclusion from social outings, parents being excluded from the workplace because they can't manage to juggle the demands of being a carer and work. There are three common stories that I hear. Oh, little Johnny was um, invited to participate. It was fantastic. Um, but we got there and the coach didn't know anything about autism and the other kids didn't know anything about autism. So the whole experience was like a square peg being jammed into a round hole. And it didn't really work out. The second story is, oh, oh Johnny was um, invited to come and be a part of it, um, but, but not with the other kids. He was um, in a different program. Or thirdly, and my least favourite, oh, Johnny was um, invited, but we noticed he was very good with numbers, so he was the person who was helping the coach score. He, 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 he's, he wasn't playing the game with the other kids. So for the billions of dollars that have been invested in technology to understand what autism is, we haven't solved this basic problem. We haven't solved the problem of inclusion. When I spoke to a friend of mine um, who's an expert in inclusion research, um, he pointed me to this paper um, by Reinders. According to the philosophers of ancient Greece, such as Plato and Aristotle, the good life for human beings in life is shared with friends. They argued that it is a life that can only thrive in a properly arranged and regulated public space. I wonder what they would have thought about the public space of 2015 for our children filled with technology and gadgets? Are we giving our children enough access to the public space? You know, grass that you fall on and, and, and hurt your knees and smell and touch and the fresh air. And what about the public space for children with developmental challenges? What have we done to arrange that public space? The good life for human beings is a life shared with friends. So we've got a problem here. We have all of this technology and understanding a lot about what autism is and what other disorders are, 
but we're not translating it enough and quickly enough to solutions, to solutions around inclusion. I believe that we have all of the answers somewhere, but we haven't made this connection from the labs and from the universities out to where it makes a difference for kids with developmental challenges. Another story. It's one degree on the coldest day in Melbourne in 18 years. I'm sitting in the car with my family. The heater is blaring. My husband and my nine-year-old son, Tom, leap out of the car. They have the biggest smiles on their face and they start heading towards the footy ground. And I see this scene repeated over and over at the car park. Mothers, dads, children, dogs, grandmothers, they're, they're smiling and they're, they're hurting like a group, meeting new friends, um, meeting old friends. My son is skipping because he skips when he's happy and, you know, I almost tear up now thinking about those moments. It is a joyous scene. They don't notice the cold. I'm in the car with my daughter and um, I'm waving and saying, actually I was texting saying, I'll be out when the temperature just lifts a little bit. But anyway, I'm enjoying it and I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm just watching this joyous moment in our community. And then my researcher hat comes on and I'm sitting there and I'm looking out and I'm watching the way that children walk. I often do that, it's an occupational hazard. And I'm watching and all I see is coordinated and smooth gates. I don't see bouncy gates. I don't see kids with balance problems. These kids are throwing the ball to each other and they're catching it, they're not dropping it. And I wonder, where are all the children with developmental challenges? Where are the children with autism? I don't see any children with cerebral palsy out there. Where are they? So this led to my idea, my big idea. We have to take this research engine that we have that has this joint focus of inclusion and we have to pair up with our peak sporting bodies. And this was about football, so I thought, well, why not the AFL? Why aren't we pairing up with them? I know the AFL is doing amazing things in inclusion, and we're doing amazing things, but we're doing them from different directions. And as I look out of my windscreen on the coldest day in 18 years, I don't see any children going to the football match. So, this sounds um, like a simple solution to the problem. Um, perhaps write a grant, um, get this going, but it, it wasn't a simple problem um, and it wasn't a simple solution. We have child researchers here and we have AFL players and AFL execs here. Um, we're kind of different. We speak different languages, we have different KPIs, we have different ways of going about the world, different organisations. How was I going to solve this problem? Where was I going to get the courage to um, go to the AFL and talk to them about this problem? I don't know if you've noticed, but some of the best psychological motivational advice comes from movies rated G and PG. And here's one of my favourite from the movie We Bought a Zoo. You know, sometimes all you need is 20 seconds of insane courage, just literally 20 seconds of just embarrassing bravery. And I promise you, something great will come of it. And for me, it did. In my 20 seconds of insane courage, I sent the email to the AFL Auskick people. The email made its way up to a general manager called Logan who had an equal passion about inclusion in sports for all children. Logan made sure that email got to the AFL executives. So here we are. We're sitting around the table at AFL House. Everybody's there. And we're talking about this joint vision about inclusion. But about halfway through the meeting, it went quiet and stalled. We really were quite different beasts, child developmental psychologists in the AFL, and the conversation was starting to falter. And I had this sinking feeling in my stomach that we'd got so far and we could almost touch it, but it wasn't going to happen. Then Logan leaned over the table and said to me, 
Nicole, just tell them what you told me. Tell them what you told me about the benefits for children with autism. Tell them that story. Another 20 seconds of courage. We had this opportunity to wrap research around what the AFL were doing. We had this opportunity to go to Irabina Autism Services and look at children with autism before they participated in AFL Auskick and then after they participated in it. And you could have knocked me down with a feather when we looked at the results. We found good evidence to suggest that there are improvements in aspects of motor functioning for these children. That's amazing. But more than that, what was more amazing was the qualitative data, the reports from parents. Dads starting to connect with their children for the first time. We don't often see dads coming into the clinic. They're busy um, working. Um, they were connecting with their children. Dads were connecting with other children. People were talking. People were sharing stories. People were included. This is the good life and this is what happened. And they re the rest, as they say, is history. The Deakin University AFL Scholar Program will start next month. And we will be looking at inclusion and how we can better do this by bringing together the research engine with um, the wonderful AFL Inclusion Program. My call to action today is for you to not assume what people with autism or any developmental challenge can and cannot do. If you're at a local sporting event and you don't see children who have developmental challenges there, don't assume they're not there because they don't want to be there. They might really, really want to be there, but that door for inclusion mightn't have been fully swung open yet. Technology cannot solve this, but we can. I'd like to finish by swearing and quoting Philip Rosenbaum, who wrote this marvellous paper called The F Words in Disability. I swear this is how we should think. Fun, function, family and fitness. Thank you. <laughs>